È un momento commovente per me di tornare a Milano. Ringrazio eh, la Presidente e i colleghi della facoltà, ovviamente studenti, amici che eh, intervengono qua a questo momento che è veramente un momento, penso, eh, di eh, grande importanza non solo tanto per la scuola, ben certo per la scuola, ma anche per il mondo fuori. La memoria di Aldo Rossi mi è molto cara, ma vorrei anche ricordare un altro maestro che mi ha insegnato gran parte di quello che so sulla musica. Non posso dire di essere come fa il titolo di Massimo Bontempelli, un altro grande italiano scrittore quasi dimenticato, e di essere il figlio di due madri, ma sono certamente l'allievo di due maestri milanesi. E ben prima di Rossi era Bruno Maderna, che seguivo assiduamente durante i tardi anni 50, studiando composizione musicale e assistendolo allo studio di fonologia eh, alla RAI, su Corso Sempione, poco distante di quella casa rustici di Terranni che già allora tenevo d'occhio. Tra Darmstadt, da dove veniva la moglie di um, Maderna, e Milano, Maderna operava come compositore e maestro d'orchestra distinguendosi per una accesa vivacità ed intelligenza, tratti specificamente milanesi, penso. Come Aldo poi anche Bruno era circondato da qualcosa di remotamente lacustre e ambedue questi maestri scendevano da paesi che versano la loro acque vers verso Milano mentre ritengono una certa diffidenza nel confron nei confronti del capoluogo. Fu la Milano di Giorgio Streller di Luciano Berio, del flautista Severino Gazzelloni, del vecchio Carlo Emilio Gadda e, come si direbbe oggi, del emergente Alberto Arbasino. In architettura BBPR furono l'epicentro di, di un assai insulare mondo dallo quale poi uscì anche Aldo Rossi. Dai tempi di Stendhal che si fingeva milanese, come sapete, si sospettava un'endemica malinconia sotto lo smalto di una voluta modernità che soverchiava gli affetti spontanei. Ad Aldo ero legato da un'amicizia quasi itinerante e che risvegliò momenti della mia infanzia zurichese, come anche della sua permanenza al Politecnico della città, che si è poi ravvicinata, come sapete, grazie al più lungo traforo alpino del mondo. Fu dunque quasi destino che volevo acquisire per il centro studi eh, Getty di Los Angeles i quaderni di lavoro che Aldo comprava spesso in cartollerie zurichesi e portava con sé durante tanti viaggi attraverso il vecchio Gotardo. La mia conferenza sarà fondamentalmente in inglese, ma numerose citazioni di testi che posso, non possono che essere letti in, origine, in forma originale, um, trovate un seminato linguistico tra il cemento inglese e i tanti piccoli pezzi di eh, coccio e di marmo italiano eh, ben eh, eh, distribuiti tra, tra questa materia strana, grigia e continua. Ok, among the first images Aldo Rossi invokes in his scientific autobiography, uh, un'immagine che sappiamo uh, dall'amico, chi ne è l'autore, Uh, is of the Church of Sant'Andrea in Mantua. Ho scelto l'edizione tedesca curata da Helfenstein, da un altro uh, collega suo e fotografo, um, per uh, dare un po' una 
una manifestazione più colta di quella bruttissima edizione inglese come la chiamava Aldo spesso. Allora, avete Rossi uh, eh, al quel momento that he acknowledges not only Leon Battista Alberti's achievement, obviously this is a unique building, which in his view consisted nel ripetere le forme e gli spazi di Roma come se non esistesse una storia contemporanea. But he also connected the space of the church with the fundamental experience of tempo. Uh, and that's the reason for the oculus. There is an outside and inside, and there is tempo. This experience was to reveal itself profoundly cleft, divided into clock time and weather, or, uh, as he put it, in tempo nel doppio significato atmosferico e cronologico. Alberti's architecture was certainly untimely, but it set a cornerstone for the age of the Renaissance, precisely because, as Rossi said, with regard to Sant'Andrea, it does not seem to relate to any contemporary architecture, uh, even the architecture around it. The, building, the buildings by Alberti were no notorious for the architect's disregard of custom and practice. They stood out as lone reminders of another civilization, of, of, of antiquity, but not really. So Alberti's successors, Bramante, Giulio Romano, Palladio, and others in their wake, sought to achieve a similar architecture that one could call fuori tempo. As Aretino put it with regard to Giulio Romano's art in general, it was caught between two different times, namely being anticamente moderno e modernamente antico. And, one should add, uh, for being, of course, uniquely itself. During the Renaissance, antique architecture was very largely present, but present in ruins, M many of them inhabited ruins. However grandiose, and the moment when the building of New St. Peter's came to um, a temporary halt in the 1530s, the new Sorry, uh, something changed. Yes, the new looked entirely like the ancient, located as it was in a gap in time rather than firmly rooted in one. So if you have St. Peter's at that moment drawn by the, the Dutch artist uh, Heemskerk, you might as well think of it as a giant remains, uh, remains of antiquity as they were known all over. Rome. So this curious ambivalence between two times and your own present moment between them is a profound, it, profoundly Italian experience, and I think it has found um, an extraordinary articulation in Aldo's work. Now, who looking at uh, who looking at Giuliano da Sangallo's drawing of the Teatro di Marcello on the left-hand side would not think of Aldo Rossi's uh, um, Cedimenti Terrestri on the right-hand side or that famous etching of Ora questo è perduto. An architecture so exposed to destruction was indeed lost uh, to modern eyes. So one wonders what secured a special place for Aldo Rossi in this lengthy story going back to the 15th century in his own post-war Italy. First in Milan, as, has been, as you've been reminded of a number of times, then of course in Europe, and finally around the world. By the way, that the funnel to Europe should have been Switzerland it is rather amusing, actually. If you leave Italy, that is a long-standing great player on the map, and Switzerland sort of squeezed in between its neighbors. But in this time, it did serve its best, namely to be a conduit to somewhere else. 
So I think it was the untimeliness of Rossi's architecture that gave it a unique character. Untimely, both with regard to when it appeared and how it looked in the midst of the 1960s. It was untimely in the sense of evading the terms in which problems were posed and solved, and in the sense of putting something forward that had no place in the townscape prevailing around it. In that sense, it is curiously reminiscent of Alberti's designs. The inaugural monument at Sigrate occupies an unidentifiable margin in time. Uh, you would be hard-pressed, except for accidental elements, to say what this is, where it is, when it is. Located, indeed, as it finds itself between resolute abstraction and a distant nature, just sort of barely waving in, particularly, of course, in the uh, presentation drawing uh, that shrouds uh, the monument uh, with uh, German oak trees from a uh, um, uh, etcher of a rather curious kind of Karl Wilhelm uh, Kolbe. Now, since the 1960s, the social struggles and the challenge to authority set the tone of the debate and prejudiced architecture, which, when put to the test, advanced paradoxical solutions. Here, too, the untimeliness, how the old Ungaretti and the young rebellious students in, uh, in Venice uh, would, would be m bridging between them another gap in time, another discontinuity. Rossi did find merit in Berlin's Stalin Allee, and for his Gallaratese housing block, he invoked a monastery in Santiago de Compostela and German uh, social housing, Wohnblöcke. Neither uh, is very near to the task or to the time. Designing a project, he averred, involved finding what has been lost, securing another lease of life, or at the very least, a memory of it, for the future. It says another important point, namely if you're occupying such a discontinuity, such a gap in time, the relationship between the past and the future is entirely cast into question. And it may very well be that memory, presumably occupied with the past, is the only conduit and vessel to go to the future. This even holds true of that Cavallo di Battaglia typology, typologia, which was once a kind of magic word, as if it captured the quintessence of architecture. And for typology, uh, one could say it's precisely a means of breaking buildings out of their time and place and rendering them timelessly available. Those tabulated in typologies belong to no time and all time. To forget architecture, to use an expression of Aldous, was one consequence of typological considerations. Another was the typology makes buildings of different purpose and location appear similar to one another in ways that you perhaps would never have suspected. But more insidiously still, it suggests a deep affinity between schematic drawings and calligraphy. This relationship prompted Rossi to say that il segno è indifferente a disegno o scrittura. Did he mean that all signs are indifferent to what they designate? And are buildings, once reduced to three-dimensional signs, equally indifferent to their place and time? One is tempted to think so, were it not that Ross's early projects belonged to sharply defined categories, memorials, which are always are for a precise event, and individuals, housing that is for a certain social group, and schools that are addressing a particular moment in the generation of the population. 
Even more consequential was the fact that in typological terms, buildings share only what is really largely indifferent to their occupants, since the occupants of all these different buildings have been different people in different times and places. Typology is able to expunge all of this and offer up something that seemed independent of and therefore free for other uses than the uses to which it had been put. Among typological schemes, Rossi had his favorites, and they invariably float free of their epochs and categories, like unmanned boats, the kind of vaisseau fantôme of architecture. Typology is the ghost ship of architecture on the ocean of time. Whether they, these designs, as you saw a moment ago, recall uh, strange Bronze Age structures on lakesides raised on stilts, or in the case of the Cabine dell'Elba, uh, vernacular beach cabins or cupboards. Rossi invoked the gigantic stables in Crenovoye, um, when classifying his student housing project in Chieti, and indirectly when he commented on the cemetery of San Cataldo in Modena. And I deliberately show this to you in the way he put it in his own catalog publication so that one gets, captures some of that extraordinary uh, capacity uh, almost to pole vault over differences of time, character, place, and purpose. In these cases, he performed the same mental operation again and again. Typology is the door through which ideas can be transported from one time into another from one category into another, as if seen in a mirror and yet out of reach. I would even go further and suggest that not only was Rossi's architecture untimely, but it was also placeless, like a Pirandellian character who keeps looking for a possible role in an other play. If there is something to what I'm saying, and you may very well, of course, disagree, then the circumstances of Rossi's debut seem inauspicious for a young architect, almost improbable. Undoubtedly, they rendered his work difficult, as you know, his standing uncertain, his reputation controversial. And in a strange way, I think, all of these enormous difficulties for the individual in life make it infinitely uh, more likely and dear to those who come after them because we know all of these difficulties and yet we also know how they were overcome. That is the great capacity of a life that interests us and has a spell on us if that we can see what someone else did under circumstances which may have been no more favorable or even worse than your own. After being relegated, and let's not forget, by ministerial decree from the Polytechnico, there followed a number of years in Zurich and soon a leap over the Atlantic uh, and in the 1980s and 90s many trips back and forth and on beyond the Western world. Uh, his is a story in stark contrasts, um, uh, in stark contrast to also most Italian architects of his own and of later generations, who tended to graft themselves to local institutions and perpetuate the particular customs and the particular ways of thinking and practicing building. Perhaps only Renzo Piano enjoyed a comparably favorable reception uh, outside of his country, if for entirely different reasons. Um, af after all, we know fame is one category it admits of the most categorical differences and reasons. Um, namely, in uh, uh, Piano's case, we could say he became the preferred purveyor of trademark designs with a gratuitous technological appeal, a kind of technological frosting on the cake. 
Of course, that goes over particularly well where they eat cake, namely in the United States. So much for historic time or chronology. But there is also the weather, the other manifestation of time. Unforgettable photograph by Luigi Ghirri um, of uh, uh, the Nebbia uh, Padana. Uh, by the way, I would uh, challenge you, it's very, very hard to photograph fog uh, because it is itself an impediment to the eyes and to uh, photographic film. It's a little bit like a, a famous Turner painting, uh, rain, speed, and steam. Well, you'd think it's impossible to paint rain, steam, and speed all at once. That would be just a mess on a glass pane. And indeed, the painting does resemble that. So it's very hard to find a photograph of what Aldo describes so often. And I have experienced, I've experienced in his company, that you're in, in a big building like in Sant'Andrea in Mantua. And on Sunday, the big portals are open and the fog is actually rolling into the uh, building and turns it instantly into an enormous theatrical stage for that very fact alone. So weather does affect your own time and place in profound ways. Rossi noted in 1980, apropos of Sant'Andrea, that he saw and this is a wonderful sentence which is poorly constructed, like many sentences in Aldo Rossi, uh, have a kind of strangely wobbly grammar to them. It says, La nebbia, um, it is the, he saw la nebbia entrare nella basilica uh, e osservarla nella galleria milanese come l'elemento imprevedibile che modifica e altera come la luce e le ombra, come le pietre ridotte e lisciate dai piedi e dalle mani di generazioni di uomini. So he reads these several layers of time out of this one moment, this split moment in time when these curious conditions are created. The touch of atmospheric change may be ever so slight, but it evokes the heavy hand of time. In 1984, Rossi let his thoughts ramble through Lombardy when he wrote that here the cathedrals were probably never white. A beautiful jab at Corby's ear, right? For reasons of fog and humidity that cause settling and fractures in buildings like torsions of the spine, signal arthritis, and worse in human condition. Time distorts things, bends them out of shape, and breaks them up. But the relics, the ruins, and rural haunts that Rossi loved, and Braghieri went along photographed, as also prompted him to seek out questi luoghi attivi e misteriosi. That's a very interesting combination, that he perceived these places as being both active sending him something at the same time he didn't know what it was it was as mysterious as the fog that surrounded them and of course it's to these luoghi that he dedicated the exhibition at the Casa di Mantegna in Mantua finding these mysterious places mostly ruins of one kind or another made up for having forgotten architecture and instead set out to recover alcuni luoghi che costituiscono una patria ritrovata. Now, these allusions are almost too portentous, right? The patria holds few mysteries when it provides the setting for our daily affairs. But when we leave it behind, when we let it suffer the vagaries of time and age, we begin to perceive it at a distance, with a sharper eye. When we do return, everything changes. The patria ritrovata has wreathed as many, has weathered as many events as the traveler in foreign lands, who also experienced any number of deformations of the familiar. 
as a parallel to his own peregrinations, his own continuous movement through countries, projects, institutions, um, and societies, and as a reminder that pow how powerfully painful and humiliating it may have been to leave Milan. The architect returned to his homeland with a more vivid feeling for its character. In both atmosphere and material, something unforeseen had occurred. In a tumble of images, that's another one of those things, like in a drawing. In a drawing, you can draw one thing after another and connect them with the line of your pen. In the sentences, you can't really do that if you want to be correct. But he does it nonetheless. Again, as if the sign itself, whether written or drawn, is immune to what it, the purposes to which it's put. He has these cascades of images and references as he does um, uh, in a, a passage um, in which both atmosphere and material uh, um, are something unforeseen. Uh, he enumerates Clara Calamai, the actress of the film Ossessione, her minestra, the gardens of Mantua and Ferrara, the vaunted race of Gonzaga horses, the stables of Count Orloff, and yet other places, all within one single sentence. Change can only occur in the dimension of time, and here the line is that dimension that jumps from word to word, from object to object. Time, however, has a way of warping our experiences and our memory. And these experiences are all related to fleeting manifestations that yet leave their trace in memory. For Aldo, a special site beyond all familiar places was the theater. Not any theater, and not even one he knew well, but his own theater, the Teatrino. Again, he belabored the word no less than the idea when he wrote, recalling once again the experience of the Milanese Galleria uh, uh, in fog of the conchiglia americana ritrovata per me nell'altro senso della conchiglia marina che mi avevo spinto all'architettura figlia della pietra e del mare biancheggiante tu meravigli la mente dei fanciulli obviously not only the minds of children but also the child in all of us is excited by seashells. Therefore, the, the Jesuit scholar, Filippo Bonanno, there's something here going on a little uh, ghostly. Oh. Wait, that's very weird. It's very weird. That's, uh, Something in this paese lontani is misterioso e nebbioso, beyond comprehension. Eccolo. Here is uh, Filippo Bonanno, who titled his treatise of 1684, Recreatio Mentis ed Oculi, as if to tease the reader, at least the foreign reader, Rossi did not name the poet Quasimodo who wrote those words about seashells, tu meravigli la mente dei fanciulli, that so closely echo the title of Bonanno's, in fact. But he harked back to what has distinguished seashells for centuries, their fascino and their puzzling status as objects that, are, that only an organism can create and that survive as dead objects, potentially for enormous spine ta ta uh, time spans for hundreds of millions of years on the bottom of the sea. Long, long after these organisms that created the shell have gone extinct. Of course, one would here want to refer to Paul Valéry, who meditated on this conundrum in an essay of 1937, and uh, on his fascination with seashells um, that has not been lost on many other architects in the 20th century. In the Teatrino, Rossi reduced reality to shells, 
to, one could almost say, fossils of the everyday. Complex relationships were brought down to a simple order of scale and growth and made the objects uh, of desire uh, that submitted willingly to the private command of the architect. The images of Tempo and Teatrino are tenuously tethered to words whose meaning is inconstant, so elusive that Rossi is casting about to pin it down in classical and modern texts before he finds the right place for it in his own work. It was the old issue of the inside-outside rapport that surfaces in many of Rossi's buildings, vexing one's sense of the distinction between exterior and interior, not only when it is so obviously reversal as in the theatre treated as a public space um, for the caviar, uh, and yet for something completely different, removed emotionally and perspectively onto stage into a depth of time that is unreachable by the public. But this distinction, which is always contradictory and which always seeks signs of its other, um, in the details was, of course, fundamental for some of the mature works too, such as the Hotel Palazzo in Fukuoka in Japan from the late 1980s. There, visitors sitting at the bar on your right find themselves in front of the elevation of the building into which they have just wandered. In this thinking, inside and outside are the defining terms of the theatre, in a reversal of their customary relationship. The hollow of the caviar is also an exterior, and the plain view of the stage an interior that shrinks away from your grasp. The seashell links animation and fixity, recording life while remaining inanimate. It has a long pedigree that was not lost on Aldo. As elementary as the correspondent parts of buildings are, and as ageless and inflected by the time of experience they appear to be, they transform the inert into a vessel that sails through the straits of time. And uh, a mirror glass is the classic locus of that untouchable, of that non-existent barrier between what is with to hand and what is beyond, what is of a past or even of a ghostly kind and what is of a real and immediate nature. In a literal sense, the Galleria in Milan and Sant'Andrea in Mantua form frames through which time wafts like the fog. You, the fog renders the passage of time virtually visible. And experiencing this, Rossi is able to master a childlike immediacy and a, a sense of wonder uh, that recreazione mentis et oculi. It is the large-eyed Aldo Rossi of some familiar photographs who may have suffered many delusions, but one, the desire to make and make ever again his beloved toys. Losing them, seeing them broken or thrown away, causes him visible pain. Uh, this pain persists through changes of momentary stimmung or feeling as the fundamental tonality of existence, leaving perhaps over time a trace of a special disposition. And such a sense of loss is tangible in Rossi's works, even when they are accomplished and send a kind of uh, promise of permanence and of renown. It is a sense of loss, even more acute in the face of victory or near victory. And the Museum of German History, the project outside, is perhaps the most poignant of these because it is itself made for history to be derailed by history. It's a pyrrhic Victory. It's a highly accomplished project for something that could never come about. So Rossi confessed that he had been 
a bad student at the Politecnico. We've heard that before. Of course, most students who become famous always say they were bad students. Um, uh, Churchill famously claimed to have been a bad student, right? That became a big statesman. Lamenting, he lamented the bland books and the boring lectures of his professors, while remembering fondly the discussions with Heinrich Helfenstein at the ETH in Zurich. Helfenstein was Ross's assistant and helpmate, a literary historian by training and a photographer by avocation, who shot some of Ross's favorite images, such as the Sunday picture. It's totally deserted, right? Only on a Sunday. Another classic way of uh, uh, representing the, the loss of the life that is in this shell every day of the week except Sunday. Um, when it is just a solemn courtyard. Throughout his autobiography, and quite casually in many conversations, Rossi would prefer to talk of literature, philosophy, paleontology, and whatever may have been on his mind, rather than of architecture as such. Uh, and this was no affectation, um, nor a false clue, but rather an admission that his imagination drew from many fields and explored moments of the past no less than speculation about the future. So he enjoyed imagining what Venice had been like before Sansovino and Palladio. Well, everybody runs there to see Sansovino, Palladio, and what came thereafter. No. Uh, he cherished this notion of a city as Carpaccio had seen it, with a lot of wooden structures and desolate shorelines. On the other hand, his time in New York revealed to him a city made entirely of stone and monuments in which the only thing built in wood are the water tanks on the roofs, a bizarre thing that in a modern city, on most every building, there should be these redwood wooden water tanks under their conical tops. And it suddenly appeared to me, and I said this at that time, that I was convinced Rossi had brought all of these water tanks to town with um, their disconcerting primitive nature because he wanted to add some of his own architecture to a place that was already finished, right? So when he had draws his uh, window of the poet in New York at the time when the twin buildings of the World Trade Center are still standing on the right-hand side, right above the hand of the San Carlone, there are, of course, those hallmark water tanks of, uh, of, of, of New York that look nothing as much as a Rossian addition to the townscape. It is appropriate to recall then that one of the episodes specially singled out by Aldo in his autobiography bears on the value of being a stranger. Uh, strangers have privileges, they have shortcomings, but they can make genuine discoveries, something that they think or other think they had never seen before. And he describes how, riding on a Vaporetto one morning in Venice, he overheard a stranger pointing out at the corner of the Cadel Duca on the Grand Canal on your right, left-hand side, um, uh, that corner column, as a relic of time of another time, of another purpose, another era, another building, this fragment was destined to assume the singular role of a symbol of architecture migrating through the work of Aldo Rossi, who must have been overwhelmed by it as much as the architecture surrounding this, in, in, this uh, objet insolite in the Venetian townscape. Suddenly it struck him that this odd column was a potente e prepotente affirmation of architecture, that here at last you could practically touch what architecture could have been, might have been, but you see, of course, only a token of it, only a small fragment um, that seems pointless in its survival and surviving by a sheer stroke of luck. 
It was also Ross's personal luck, for he carried that column with him to various places and made it a placeholder for architecture. If one may be permitted to make such generalizations about another person's life, after all, we're not only talking about architecture, we talk about an, an individual, a remarkable person. I'd venture to say that Rossi was lucky to be relegated from the Politecnico, that nothing better could have happened to him than to be invited to Zurich and lured on to New York, and that the breakup of his Milan studio, although painful for everyone involved, propelled him further than he would ever have gone on his own. The direction he chose left many a colleague and friend in doubt. There can be little doubt, however, that Ross's last years, which were those of the waning 20th century, one of the most incredible times in history, found him wavering between affirmation and submission. Submission to tendencies that led into the lowlands of facile imitation of historic forms and the consequent loss of the keen sense of time by which he impresses us so deeply before. And uh, as you can see here, uh, the other drawings in the exhibition, um, uh, how, in a sense, quaint, almost archaeological, the drawing looks as opposed to the stark extrusion that seems almost as if it had been made on a three-dimensional printer in the actual building. The Schützenstrasse block, as it is known in Berlin, does indeed raise questions that find no easy answer and probably no answer on sight other than those offered by a city that had been virtually leveled during the war. So the precondition for this is complete destruction. But then, also a city that was put through experiences as those of Frederick the Great, who imported Palladian facades by the yard, you could say, and used them like wallpaper on buildings in Potsdam, and now one might say, why not? A bit of Michelangelo may be just what the doctor ordered for the ailing city. That Rossi finds himself posthumously in the company of those Berliners who have no compunction about surrounding one of the very rare surviving Schinkel buildings, the Werdische Kirche, with the schlock of post-modern uh, pseudo-classical buildings, is perhaps undeserved, but quite poignant nonetheless. The excavation of garages uh, under these blocks uh, has so endangered the survival of the church that it is now maintained by internal scaffolding to prevent further severe damage. While all around it, on the right-hand side, you see a drawing of what is now up that is a shroud around the Verdische uh, Kirche. It's like a bad dream about Schützenstrasse block. Within the spectrum of architecture in Italy, ranging as it did from Paolo Portoghese to Super Studio, just to give you this kind of extraordinary span, Rossi had managed to secure a labile balance between designing memories and imagining their future. Don't fear, it's not Rossi on the high wire. Uh, his iteration, however, led to untimely confrontations, such as those of his window of the poet in New York, you see, or to a contamination of moments that have little in common and do not find their place where they appear. There was, however, one moment when Rossi was both ahead of himself and standing, I would say, proudly besides what he was making. The Teatro del Mondo in 1979 floated onto the lagoon as the perfect vessel for a time bandit. A time bandit is, of course, an imaginary figure that tries to escape from historical time. Forever remembered as an image. The teatro recalled Venice before San Sovino and Palladio, its wooden hull a ghost, its silhouette a momentary companion to the city's skyline. 
its inevitable disappearance as much a part of its existence as the changing cloudscape is what makes it so poignant. Here, at dusk, time was one and the same with tempo. He said it in so many words himself. È sempre stata mia intenzione di scrivere i progetti, i racconti, film, quadri, sempre più indipendentemente da ogni tecnica, perché così questo si identifica maggiormente con la cosa essendo nel contempo una proiezione della realtà. Thank you.